Capital presents Comedy, Economics, and Carbon Tax with your own Bauman. Bauman has a Ph.D. in economics, but got into stand-up comedy after writing a parody of an economics textbook in grad school. He's authored several cartoon guides to economics and done some formal teaching, but considers stand-up his job job. Thank you for uh, inviting me to come here and uh, join you tonight here in Juneau. My name is Yaron Baum, and I appear before you this evening, ladies and gentlemen, as the world's first and only stand-up economist. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, it's a niche market. <laughs> I really only have one thing going for me as a stand-up economist, and that's low expectations. Uh, actually, that's not true. I have one other thing going for me as a stand-up economist. I get to make fun of macroeconomists. <laughs> you know I'm a real economist because I can make fun of subdisciplines that are totally indistinguishable <laughs> to people on the outside. You know, people in Washington State where I live make fun of people in Oregon, and people in Alabama make fun of people in Mississippi, and people in prison make fun of people in graduate school. <laughs> I did go through five years of uh, graduate school, got my PhD in economics, only to decide that I wanted to do stand-up comedy. You can imagine how much this thrilled my father. <laughs> he told me I'd never make it as a stand-up economist, and I said, why not? And he said, because there's no demand. <laughs> We're going to have a good time tonight. I said, don't worry, Dad. I'm a supply-side economist. <laughs> I just stand up and let the jokes trickle down. <laughs> I believe in the Laffer curve. That's, act that's actually just my joke to test how much economics you all know. A and then I kind of arrange the rest of the routine accordingly. I'm giving you all about a six. <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. And by the way, I want to say that, I, you know, people say that economics and stand-up comedy don't have very much in common, but that's totally not true. In both cases, very few people sit in the front row. <laughs> so I want to thank you for making me feel at home. Uh, you know, when Jim and uh, the World Affairs Council invited me to come and join you tonight, uh, pretty much the only instructions that they gave me was that I should try not to offend anybody. So I figured I would start with some jokes about politics. <laughs> now, I like to tell jokes about politics that appeal to people across the political spectrum. This may be a difficult thing to do in Alaska. I'm not sure. Uh, I've heard that Juno is, is a separate place from, from other parts of Alaska. In any case, I'm going to do with you the same thing I do with uh, uh, you know, the left-wing audiences I speak with in San Francisco, or the trucking executives I speak with, spoke with on the banks of the Arkansas River. <laughs> that was a story. Uh, I'm going to divide you up across the political spectrum, all right? So this is audience participation. So the way most people think about politics is left-wing and right-wing. So I'm going to divide you up right down the middle here. And for the next couple of minutes, you folks here on my left, for the next couple of minutes on my left over here, you all get to represent the left wing of the American political spectrum. <laughs> that, was, that was actually an appropriate amount of enthusiasm for the left wing of the American political spectrum. All right, any folks here on the right, come on, I need you all to come through for me. You all on my right wing. Drill baby. Okay, that was all right. I, get, I was going to say that it's been a long winter, but apparently you haven't had a, much of a winter either. We didn't in Seattle. Uh, in any case, uh, that was pathetic, right wing, uh, especially compared to Texas, because the last time I was in Texas, they started chanting USA. <laughs> so I want you all to try that for me. Come on, you all over here. You guys are my right wing. Come on. You say. You say. You There we go. That was better, right wing. Well done. And you folks over here on the left, you all were good also. No, no, because all the right wing was chanting USA. You were just sitting there looking befuddled and vaguely unpatriotic. <laughs> I know that's how most people think about politics as left wing and right wing. But if you think about economics or political science, what we call median voter theory, that actually leaves out the most important part of the American political spectrum. The left wing is actually over here. And the right wing is over here, and you all in the middle, you all are the most important part of the American political spectrum, 
you all are my swing voters. Now, a couple of very important things about swing voters. All right, first of all, in America, there are a lot of swing voters. All right, if you are not a communist, <laughs> or a fascist, then you are probably a swing voter. And if you do not know the difference between communists and fascists, then you are definitely <laughs> a swing voter. Uh, now your job, swing voters, when it comes to politics and current events, extremely important swing voters, your job is to pay absolutely no attention whatsoever. <laughs> you got that covered? <laughs> and then every four years, you determine the fate of the free world. <laughs> I know that sounds like a big responsibility, but trust me, don't give it a second thought. <laughs> and that's really how the political spectrum is divided. You have the left wing, the stereotype about the left wing is that the left wing is spineless. <laughs> See, they just take it. <laughs> Excellent, very good left wing. You got the left wing, the left wing is spineless. You got the right wing, the right wing is heartless. And you got the center, the center is clueless. <laughs> Clueless and apathetic. You're so clueless, you don't know what apathetic means. <laughs> You're so apathetic, you can't be bothered to look it up. Uh, now, there are also, of course, the extremes of the American political spectrum, the far right of the American political spectrum. Folks, uh, on the very last row here on the far right, you all on the far right, hello, sir. You all get to be my, uh, you get to be my libertarians. That's cool, you can do what you want. Far left to the American political spectrum, folks against the uh, side here on the far left, you all on the far left get to be my libertarians. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing confused looks from the swing voters. No, no, I had someone sitting in the middle once who said, libertarians? You mean the people that check books out for me? <laughs> and I had to clarify that libertarians are freedom lovers. Right, they come in two flavors. You got right-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use guns. You got left-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use drugs. <laughs> now, both wings of the Libertarian Party want to abolish Social Security and Medicare, right, which makes total sense, okay? Because who's gonna make it to 65? when the world is full of meth fiends with machine guns. <laughs> Many people are actually surprised that the libertarians are the far right of the American political spectrum. They expect the Tea Party to be the far right of the American political spectrum, but the Tea Party is actually kind of back that way in like deep right center field. This mix of the far right and the deep center, this explosive combination of radical individualism and extreme cluelessness. No, no, these are people who believe in social Darwinism, but don't believe in Darwin. <laughs> I, I, was, I was actually, I was in Mississippi not too long ago giving a talk, and there were some Tea Party folks in the crowd, so I could talk to them, and I, I said, look, I said, I can tell that you're angry. You know, why are you so angry? And this guy jumped up and he said, it's the gays. <laughs> And I said, well, what's wrong with the gays? And he said, they're breeding like rabbits. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that doesn't make any sense. Right? And he said, oh, yeah. He said, where do you live? And I said, I live in Seattle. And he said, how many of your neighbors are gay? And I said, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like all of them. <laughs> and he was like, see, see. Anyway, there's the Tea Party deep right center field. I would make similar jokes about Occupy Wall Street, which is in deep left center field, but you are not allowed to make fun of the dead. <laughs> oh. Oh, no. I've, I've offended the left wing. <laughs> I am sorry, left wing. I will make it up to you later at the drum circle. <laughs> right, right, right wing, I'll explain to you later what a drum circle is. I, I've been thinking a lot about politics lately because uh, I was in China not too long ago and it, it had been my first time in China and I really didn't know what to expect and I wanted to have something to say in case the Chinese people came up to me and said, you know, tell me about democracy. 
Uh, that didn't happen. <laughs> Uh, instead, I went to China, and the Chinese people came up to me, and they said, what's up with your budget deficits? And I had to say, let me tell you about democracy. <laughs> I know when it comes to the budget deficit, the left blames the right, and the right blames the left, but I actually blame the center. Right? I don't think we have a budget deficit because left-wing people believe in mandates or because right-wing people believe in markets. I think we have a budget deficit because people in the middle believe in magic. No, no, let me explain, all right? Every time a left-wing politician says, hey, I've got a great idea for a road or a school or a hospital, the response from swing voters is, yeah, let's do that. And then every time a right-wing politician says taxes are too high and we should cut taxes, the response from swing voters is, yeah, let's do that. And then it turns out we have a budget deficit and swing voters blame the politicians, which is kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, this is kind of like going to the doctor for your checkup and the doctor tells you that you've been putting on weight. And the left side of your brain says, huh, I guess I better exercise more. And the right side of your brain says, huh, I guess I better stop eating so many donuts. And the middle part of your brain says, huh, I guess I better get a new doctor. <laughs> right? Then the tea party busts into your hospital room, jumps up on the crazy chair, and they're like, I know how you can cut your weight in half. You know, you don't need to exercise more. You don't need to stop eating donuts. And you say like, whoa. What gives you the right to interrupt my doctor's appointment? They say the First Amendment. Oh. Like, how did you get past hospital security? The Second Amendment. <laughs> All right, smarty pants, what's the Third Amendment? I don't know. <laughs> Nobody remembers the Third Amendment. I don't know, but I know how you can cut your weight in half. You don't need to exercise more. You don't need to stop eating donuts. You just need to use the metric system. If you did not get that joke, <laughs> that's totally not your fault, all right? That's my bad. I mean, first of all, let's be honest. The joke makes no sense, right? Because the Tea Party would never endorse the metric system. And secondly, in order to understand the joke, you have to know that like 300 pounds is only 150 kilos, right? Which means the joke pretty much only makes sense to scientists, Canadians, and drug dealers. So I want you to look around at who laughed at that joke. <laughs> and if they're not scientists or Canadians. Uh, many people are uh, uh, surprised about economics comedy, that I make a living doing economics comedy. They're sort of puzzled that, uh, that such a thing actually exists. So I want to I share with you a little piece of economics comedy. Uh, this is a new bit, that a uh, uh, relatively new bit I've been working on. This is called uh, What to Expect When You're Expecting the Nobel Prize. So. Uh, uh, here's what to expect when you're expecting the Nobel Prize. I actually used to teach high school and I shared this with my students and I said, you know, do you get the, do you get the, the joke that's in the title here? And one of the students said, isn't there like a baby book called What to Expect When You're Expecting? And I said, that's very good. How did you know that? And he said that he saw it in the movie Knocked Up. <laughs> so, education. Uh, so here's what to expect when you're expecting the Nobel Prize. First of all, you should expect an early morning phone call from a long dead economist. So when you win the Nobel Prize, you get a phone call that comes at kind of a reasonable hour Sweden time. <laughs> but it's 6 o'clock in the morning on the East Coast, 3 o'clock in the morning on the West Coast, and they tell you that you won the Nobel Prize. And then they call you back a few minutes later and do a phone interview and record it. And they transcribe it, and they put the transcript on the internet for everybody to see. So here are some of the uh, excerpts from the interview with, uh, this is Edmund Phelps, who won the Nobel Prize in 2006. And the interview is being conducted by the editor-in-chief of the Nobel Prize website whose name is, well, you'll see in a moment what his name is. So here's, here's the interview. Hello, my speech to Professor Phelps, please. And he says, who's calling? And the fellow says, I'm calling from the Nobel Foundation, and my name is Adam Smith. <laughs> and Edmund Phelps just starts cracking up, right? And like, <laughs> here's this guy calling at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, my name is Adam Smith. Congratulations with the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, and Adam Smith says, I know it could be a hoax call with a name like that. It's a terrible burden I carry. <laughs> uh, so one of the neat things about reading through some of these transcripts is you get to see the human side of some of these famous economists. And I don't know if anybody reads Us Weekly magazine, but they have, they have a segment called Celebrities Are Just Like Us. You know, celebrities use the ATM machine and celebrities buy groceries. And I think they should start running a little segment called Nobel Prize Winners. They're just like us. Uh, so here's the interview 
with uh, Lenin Hurwitz and his wife Evelyn. So Lenin Hurwitz, the oldest person to win the Nobel Prize, not just in economics, but in any discipline. So here's the interview with them in 2007. Adam Smith calls up and says, good morning, Professor Hurwitz. And he says, hello. And, and his wife says he's hard of hearing. So Adam Smith says, I'm sorry, I'll speak louder. Can you hear me now? And his wife says, yes. <laughs> And then, thank you, my name is Adam Smith, and ha, 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 they all start laughing again. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, cartoon economics books that are, that are super fun. I, I hope you can check them out on my website, standupeconomist.com, or I brought some copies here uh, uh, if you're interested in taking a look at them. But one of the fun things in the book is we have this whole series of gags that we try to explain what people won the Nobel Prize for in kind of fun and interesting ways. So here's Jim, Jim Tobin saying don't put all your eggs in one basket, and the King of Sweden says, congratulations, you win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and this is actually based on a true story. So Tobin died maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and this story was in his uh, obituary in the New York Times. So he won the Nobel Prize uh, partly for something called portfolio selection theory, which is about trading off risk versus reward and building optimal portfolios and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so when he went to Sweden to get the Nobel Prize, at the press conference, the reporters said, well, tell us about portfolio selection theory. And Tobin said, well, you know, like there's alpha and there's beta. Uh, and the reporter said, no, 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 that's too complicated. Make it simple. And so Tobin said, well, it's kind of like don't put all your eggs in one basket. And then the next day, headlines around the world said, economist wins Nobel Prize for don't put all your eggs in one basket. Uh, so this one is a true story. The other ones we just made up. So here's uh, Gary Becker saying sometimes crime does pay. Uh, so Becker's at the university, or he was until he passed away recently, at the University of Chicago. He uh, won the Nobel Prize for applying economic insights to things that we previously didn't really think about as being economics, like uh, crime and drug addiction and family dynamics, things like that. Uh, John Nash figured out the optimal strategy for rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> he was in the, uh, featured in the book and the movie, A Beautiful Mind. So he won for laying the foundations of, uh, of game theory. Uh, George Akerlof says buying an individual health insurance policy can be a real pain in the neck. Uh, if you're interested in uh, things related to Obamacare, a lot of it comes down to adverse selection issues that he talked about uh, in his paper, The Market for Lemons. Joseph Stiglitz says sometimes the invisible hand is invisible because it's not there. <laughs> Actually a classic Stiglitz line. Daniel Kahneman says human beings are not always rational. And the King of Sweden is like, wow, really? Uh, so Kahneman is a psychologist at Princeton, and he won the Nobel Prize in economics for laying the foundations of what we now call behavioral economics, sort of looking at to what extent do people actually behave the way that rational economic models say that they do. Uh, a couple years ago, Eleanor Ostrom won the Nobel Prize. She says there's more than one way to scale a fish. So she studied fishery situations, other tragedy of the common situations around the world, and looked at the extent to which local communities were able to address those problems on their own. Uh, and then someday, uh, somebody, my vote is for Marty Weitzman at Harvard, who's going to win the Nobel Prize for the idea that the way to get people to pollute less is to make polluting expensive. Uh, he was an he's an environmental economist. This is the idea that, that I work on also uh, as an economist, so I'll come back and, and talk about that uh, a little more in a few minutes. Um, but first, I figured I should, uh, I should show you my t-shirt before I go any further. This is my, um, <laughs> this is, this is my Enjoy Capitalism t-shirt, uh, made in China. If you look at the tag on the back, it's actually made out of 80% cotton and 20% irony. Uh, dry, dry, clean only. Um, I did live in China for five months. I, I, I work on climate change issues, so I figured if I was going to work on climate issues, I should learn something about China. So I finagled a position at a Chinese university uh, and lived in Beijing for five months. I want to show you the place where I lived. This is a view from my uh, apartment complex window. I lived in a housing complex in Beijing that houses 400,000 people. And I was one of two non-Chinese people who lived there. Uh, it was me and the guy that everybody there referred to as the black guy. Uh, and then one day, I was walking down the street to the bus stop, and I saw a black guy. And I kind of lost my sense of propriety a little bit. Like, I kind of stared at him. And finally, I walked up to him, and I said, excuse me. I said, you must be the But before I get the words out, he pointed at me. And he said, excuse me, he said, you must be the white guy. <laughs> sure enough, I was the white guy. He was the black guy. 
Uh, he was a super nice guy. He was there from Ghana. He was there on a scholarship. We went to McDonald's. We had lunch. <laughs> International sign of friendship. Uh, anyway, this is the view from, about, uh, from my apartment window. About 5% of the time it looked like this. Uh, much more often the view from my apartment window looked like that. Yeah, yeah so some pretty serious pollution problems in China. Um, so these uh, 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 local air pollution problems are not the same thing as, as uh, global climate change, but they're correlated, right? They're both related to, uh, to issues related to, to burning fossil fuels. So um, uh, I want to transition now and share with you the, the serious part of my bit, and then I will go back to telling you jokes. So everything you need to know about climate change in just a couple of slides. Right, first of all, we have this fact that carbon concentrations in the atmosphere are going up. Nobody really doubts that this is primarily caused by human activity, right, burning fossil fuels and deforestation. Then we have this theory that says that if carbon concentrations go up, then global temperatures are going to go up. This theory actually predates Al Gore. <laughs> yeah. They laughed at that joke more in Texas. Uh, it goes all the way back to this fellow, Arrhenius, who was a chemist in Sweden. And in 1896, he made the first estimate of how much global temperatures would increase if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere which we're on track to do kind of the middle of this century. And his estimate from 1896, about five degrees Celsius, nine degrees Fahrenheit, is still pretty close to the range that climate scientists talk about today. The big difference between where he was then and where we are now is that he thought that climate change was going to be awesome uh, because he lived in Sweden. <laughs> and we tend to be a little more concerned with changing the basic functionings of planet Earth. In any case, We've been running this experiment on planet Earth for the last 150 years or so, and here are the results of the experiment. The blue dots are individual years, annual temperatures, global average temperatures. The red bars are 10-year average temperatures from the 1880s up to the 1970s. And then there's the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s. For what it's worth, the first few years of this decade, temperatures going up pretty much in line with the projections of climate science. Now, if you happen to not believe that humans are partly responsible for increasing global temperatures, I will try to find common ground with you anyway. <laughs> and the common ground comes from the way that economists think about pollution problems, which is that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. Because right? when you make polluting expensive, you get market forces working to promote conservation and innovation, development of new technologies, all the things that I, at least, love about capitalism. So what I work on as an environmental economist is using the tools of economics and the power of capitalism to protect the environment. Okay, tools of economics, power of capitalism, protect the environment. A couple of policy tools to talk about, like a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system, but the point of those policy tools is to drive up the price of fossil fuels. Now this is generally the part in my talk where people stop laughing. <laughs> because it's hard to convince people that we should be paying more for gasoline and electricity and things like this. But there is a side benefit to these policies, other than the main benefit, if you know, of potentially saving the world. Uh, and the side benefit is that if you do these policies right, you generate a pile of revenue. Government can do all sorts of things with that revenue. The idea that I work on and talk to folks about is that we could be using most or all of that revenue to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform or tax shifting or revenue neutral tax swaps. Right? The idea being that if we had higher taxes on things we want less of, like pollution, then we could afford to have lower taxes on things we want more of, like jobs and income and savings and investment. And this is where I find common ground even with folks like George Will, a conservative columnist for the Washington Post. He came to one of my classes a few years ago. He doesn't believe that humans are partly responsible for increasing global temperatures. But I asked him if he would support replacing part of the payroll tax, part of the employment tax in this country, with a carbon tax. And he said that he was all for it because he hates the payroll tax. <laughs> and with unemployment at the time was 7 or 8%, right, I still think it's too high. I hate the payroll tax. Right? And Al Gore hates the payroll tax. Al Gore says we should tax what we burn and not what we earn. So I asked George Will what he thought about the fact that he and Al Gore agreed on this particular issue. And George Wells said, well, he said, an idea should not be held responsible for the people who believe in it. <laughs> uh, in any case, economists kind of across the political spectrum think that this is a pretty good idea. And there's even a place that's done this. So in the eyes of many economists, the best climate policy in the world uh, is uh, to, you, to the north of where you are here, or I guess to the east also, uh, in the Canadian province of British Columbia. 
right, where in 2008 a right of center government said, look, we want to do something about climate change, we want to be market friendly, we don't want to grow government, so they implemented a revenue neutral carbon tax. So all the money that comes in from the carbon tax is used to reduce personal and corporate income taxes in the province of British Columbia. There's an offset for low income households. Really a terrifically smart policy. Policy has been in place uh, since 2008, went up to a peak of $30 per ton of CO2 as of 2012. Uh, so yes, folks in BC pay 30 cents a gallon more for gasoline, but they also have the lowest personal income taxes in Canada, the lowest corporate income taxes in the G8 group of rich democracies. And uh, we can actually see how the policy has been working since it went into effect in 2008. So first of all, here's sales of petroleum products. This is BC is in green compared to Canada as a whole is in blue relative to sales in 2007 before the policy went into effect. And you can see that petroleum sales in BC have fallen uh, both in absolute terms and relative to Canada as a whole. My title for this slide is uh, Economics Works. When you make something more expensive, people buy less of it. We can look at the economy of BC, which has been doing fine, just as well as the economy of Canada as a whole. In fact, there are uh, some studies that suggest that the BC economy is going to do better than it would have done otherwise because the new tax system is sort of a, uh, less of a drag on the economy than the tax system they had before. So uh, I work with a, a group in Washington State on bringing a similar policy to Washington State where I live. Uh, so here's the, the policy that we're working on. We don't have an income tax in, in Washington State, so the basic idea is to have a carbon tax and mo use most of the revenue to reduce the state sales tax. Uh, so we can cut the state sales tax by a full percentage point. So in very broad terms, what our policy does is folks are going to pay a few hundred dollars more a year for fossil fuels and a few hundred dollars less a year for everything else. There's also some money for an earned income tax credit benefit for low income households and there's a tax reduction for energy intensive manufacturers where we effectively eliminate the business tax uh, for manufacturers in the state of Washington. Uh, our group called Carbon Washington is actually aiming to put this on uh, the ballot. Uh, in November 2016 we're going to start collecting signatures uh, uh, down in Washington state in a week or two. So I hope you'll spread the word among folks you know down in Washington State uh, if you're interested. And just to give you a sense of what the ballot title is going to say, this is, this is what uh, the draft ballot title is. Initiative measure 732 concerns taxes. This measure would impose a carbon emission tax on certain fossil fuels and fossil fuel generated electricity, reduce the sales tax by one percentage point and increase a low income exemption and reduce certain manufacturing taxes should this measure be enacted into law. Uh, so that's what we're aiming to do in Washington State. I was thinking about when I travel around, uh, I usually talk about how a BC style carbon tax would work in different locations. You know, what kind of existing taxes could you reduce? Uh, and then I came to Alaska. Uh, and uh, there aren't a whole lot of taxes in Alaska that you could reduce with a carbon tax. So I, so I came up with an idea that, that uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test out on you. I don't know what you'll think about this, but, but I call this the Alaska Temporary Fund. <laughs> So this is to partner up with a permanent fund. The permanent fund idea, I think, being that you want to have this trust fund that's going to last you know, in, indefinitely to, to benefit the residents of Alaska. The other, the temporary fund isn't something that's just going to carry you through till, till uh, 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 presumably we find something, some better alternatives to fossil fuels. But just to give you a sense of if you had a BC style carbon tax in Alaska, right, fossil fuel emissions in Alaska, about 38 million tons of CO2, about half of that is from industry, half of that is from transportation. So if you had the same tax they have in British Columbia, $30 per ton of CO2, that's about 30 cents a gallon of gasoline, it's about 3 cents a kilowatt hour of coal fired power, half that for natural gas, you, know, you generate maybe a billion dollars a year. In the state of Alaska, reduce emissions, who knows, 10 or 15%, and that's maybe $1,400 a person. So that's roughly comparable. I think you get $1,800 a year at the moment in the permanent, with the permanent fund dividends. And so imagine a situation where fossil fuels were more expensive, but individuals each got a check that would compensate them. And this is the idea that's actually advocated for at a national level by a terrific group that's called Citizens Climate Lobby. Uh, there are usually chapters, uh, there are chapters all over the world now actually, but there might be some here in Alaska. So if you're interested in this idea, this is what they talk about. They talk about the U.S. adopting a carbon tax and then just dividending the, dividending the money back to everybody on a per capita basis uh, throughout the country. What else could you do in, in uh, uh, Alaska? You could uh, eliminate the corporate income tax, which I think is about half of that, takes up about half of that kind of that revenue. And then you could, could dividend the money back to individuals. 
But even for uh, refineries, for example, or, or oil companies, you could think about the industrial operations where now I think industry in Alaska pays a tax based on income or uh, gross receipts or some sort of quote unquote normal uh, tax mechanism. Think about a situation where you could eliminate those taxes and instead have corporations pay taxes based on how much carbon they emit. And I would argue as an economist that that's a good way to line up sort of social goals with private incentives. You want them to have uh, an incentive to reduce carbon emissions and, and using the tax system is a good way to do that. So uh, just an idea that I want to plant in your heads. And now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, oh, sorry, I have one other thing I want to say before I go back to telling you jokes. Um, uh, I want to give you a, a global perspective on this since this is the World Affairs Council. So this is my story about why I, I spend a lot of time working on this issue and why I think climate change is important. And it comes down to something that I call the five Chinas theory of the world. And the five Chinas theory of the world says you can take world population, which is about 7 billion people. You divide by five, you get 1.4 billion, which is approximately the population of China. And it's actually divide the world, you can divide the world up into these five population groups of the size of China. So China, India has about as many people as China. Add up everybody else in developing Asia, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Philippines, Vietnam, put them all together, about the same population as China. And so one of the lessons of the Five Chinas theory of the world is that there are a lot of people in Asia. Right. The OECD is the fourth China, essentially the rich world. So North America, Europe, Japan, a couple other random countries, South Korea, all together about the same population as China. And the fifth China is everybody else, principally Africa and South America. So if you think back to a joke that I told uh, a few minutes ago, if in very broad strokes to very overgeneralize the world, if you were to divide the world up into five people, you get one white person, one black person, and three Asian people. Okay. So this is important because if you look at carbon emissions from these five Chinas, you get this picture. At the beginning of this century, the rich world was responsible for about half of world CO2 emissions. Okay. And I think there are going to be two big stories of this century. One of them is going to be about growth and development, as uh, you know, well, the path that we've seen China take in the last few decades is, I would argue, hopefully going to be followed by India, by Africa, as people come out of poverty and get access to electricity, to transportation, to healthcare, to things that we take for granted. I think the other big story this century is going to be dealing with the environmental impacts of having 7 billion people on this planet, right, growing to 10 or 11 billion people who are all trying to live the lifestyles that, that we live today. So that's my story for why I think um, climate change is such an important issue. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I will go back to telling you jokes. <laughs> so thank you for bearing with me on that. Uh, although I did this once for a very conservative crowd in Minnesota, and this fellow came up to me at the end of my talk and said that the stuff I said about climate change was the funniest part of my whole routine. <laughs> um, I do have a couple of jokes that are not about uh, economics. I have a joke about speaking Spanish, uh, which I do reasonably well, but not perfectly, as I learned a few years ago. This was well before I was married, and I was down in Ecuador practicing my Spanish with a beautiful young woman in a bar, because economists are people too. <laughs> and, and finally, she turned to me and she said in Spanish, she said, if you're so great, how come you're not married? And I wanted to say something sort of flirtatiously self-deprecating, you know, like, I don't know, maybe women just don't like me. And what I ended up saying was, tal vez no me gustan las mujeres which means maybe I don't like women. <laughs> when I found out what I said, I felt very embarazada, which, which means pregnant. <laughs> to watch out for the false cognates. I also have a joke. I never know how this joke is going to do. I have no idea how this joke is going to do here, but uh, I have a joke about quinoa. <laughs> how many people here actually know what quinoa is? Oh, wow. Uh, what is quinoa for the rest of the crowd? What's it's a South American grain, okay. Uh, the locals can't afford it that who can't afford? The locals can't afford it anymore. Locals can't afford it anymore. Oh, uh, okay. That, that wasn't the answer I was expecting, but all right. Uh, yes, that's the second strangest response I've ever got. I did a show once in New York, and I said, someone said, oh, it's a grain, and this fellow in the front row was like, no, it's not a grain, because you can eat it during Passover. And he said, it's a seed. And I was like, look, I'm just trying to do a comedy show here, right? <laughs> like, we don't need to pull out the Talmud. Uh, 
Anyway, uh, fortunately, the joke about quinoa is a meta joke, so you don't actually have to know what quinoa is to get the joke. The meta joke is that it's very difficult to tell jokes about quinoa because 90% of the American public has no idea what quinoa is, and that the people who do know what it is, half of them think it's pronounced quinoa. <laughs> so I've learned that really the only place that where I can ever successfully tell jokes about quinoa is at the hippie food co-op. Because of the hippie food co-op, not only does everybody know the substance named quinoa, at the hippie food co-op, everybody knows a person named quinoa. <laughs> you know, they're the members of the ancient grain family. This is my brother, Tef, and my sister, Amarin. <laughs> my name is Kemlet. I'll be here all night. Um, it's like the best reaction I've ever gotten to that joke. You guys are great. I love you. But we're going to move on. Uh, I'm happy to say that the last few years have been good years for economics comedy. Uh, I, <laughs> yes. uh, I got to be on the PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, for example. Uh, yes. Now, I don't know how much you all know about the world of stand-up comedy, but let me just tell you this. In the world of stand-up comedy, ladies and gentlemen, it does not get any bigger <laughs> than the PBS NewsHour <laughs> with Jim Lehrer. I've been getting phone calls nonstop on my rotary dial telephone. Uh, it was actually pretty amazing. They interviewed three economists on this show. They interviewed uh, 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 Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize. They interviewed Joseph Stiglitz, who won the Nobel Prize. And they interviewed me. Uh, I felt like kind of a self-aware version of Sarah Palin. <laughs> I wasn't sure how that joke would have done here. but uh, <laughs> And what did they ask me? My moment of TV fame when the PBS News Hour, they asked me if I'd ever bombed on stage. All right, now a couple of things about this. All right, first of all, I am not afraid of failure. Okay. I'm an economist. <laughs> Secondly, I'm a professional comedian, right? So if a joke doesn't work, you just sort of keep throwing stuff out there until you find something that sticks, which is basically the same thing that the Fed and the Treasury have been doing for the last six or seven years. <laughs> Finally, I had to admit, on the PBS NewsHour, that in fact I had bombed on stage. The worst show I ever did was in October of 2008. You remember what was happening to the world economy and global stock markets, October of 2008? It looked like we were going back into the Great Depression. In October of 2008, I did a show in Colorado Springs for a group of bankers. <laughs> now, I'm not allowed to tell you which bank it was because I, I signed a non-disclosure agreement. But let me just say that if you wanted to figure out which bank it was, it wouldn't be, well, so far to go. Uh, <laughs> such, such a smart crowd. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, they were a tough crowd, and comedy is a violent business. All right, If you're doing well, then you're killing. And right? if you're doing badly, then you're bombing. Uh, and I totally bombed that show. And I actually did so poorly, I spent a fair amount of time afterwards sort of soul searching like trying to figure out where had I lost the connection with this audience of bankers in Colorado Springs in October of 2008. And I finally realized that I lost them on my opening line. And my opening line was, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Fortunately, I've done, a I've done a number of other shows more recently for banks and other financial institutions, and they have gotten much better especially because I've learned an important lesson. I have learned to get paid in advance. <laughs> well, because you never know whether the bank is going to be there for you tomorrow. It's like moral hazard in reverse. Uh, I'll tell you about some other recent developments in the world of economics comedy. Um, I made fun of the right, so I'll make fun of the left. This sign, Obama equals Keynesian, question mark. Keynesian economics going back to the idea of John Maynard Keynes, the British economist who argued that you could use you know, fiscal and monetary policy to bring the economy out of a recession, for example. So uh, there was a left-wing rally in Washington, D.C., and this right-winger showed up with this sign, Obama equals Keynesian, question mark, and then took videos of all these left-wingers coming up to them, and they were really mad, and they were like, that is ridiculous. You know, his birth certificate is on file in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> he is not Kenyan. Uh, another fine piece of economics humor, uh, this is a real economics paper. The title of this paper is, Can Financial Innovation Help to Explain the Reduced Volatility of Economic Activity? A paper that was published in 2006. 
Shortly before financial innovation led to the greatest increase in the volatility of economic activity since the Great Depression, you may think this bodes ill for the research that was done by these scholars, but in fact, it's okay. I have tracked down the abstract of this paper, and here's the abstract of this paper. Uh, no. Uh, I did mention that I've got these cartoon economics books. I'm happy to uh, uh, sell you some copies if you're interested, or you can get them on my website, standupeconomist.com, or, uh, or elsewhere. And then my new book uh, is called The Cartoon Introduction to Climate Change, co-authored with Grady Klein. And I want to give you an example from this book. It's actually related, related to the, uh, the Five Chinas theory of the world. So I want to show you how we present that uh, sort of in, in the cartoon book. So we talk about business as usual and how business as usual would make carbon emissions explode and to see why we divide the world up into these five population groups that are the size of China. So there they are, and you can see the waiter saying they each need 1.4 billion napkins. Uh, and then the rich world makes up just one of those five Chinas, but it's responsible for about half of world uh, fossil fuel consumption, which we relate to kind of like cakes. So the rich world gets one cake, and the other four Chinas share the second cake. And then under business as usual, if there's economic growth, the other four Chinas could catch up by 2100. Right. And that would mean three more cakes plus population growth could add another two cakes. Uh, so the end result being that that's a lot of cakes. So, so that's how we talk about that in the, in the, uh, the cartoon climate change book. So I, I hope you'll uh, uh, check those books out. Um, it's not typical in comedy shows to do Q&A. Uh, <laughs> but I've been told that there is a microphone here. Uh, and I do have some more jokes that I can tell, but um, uh, I don't know if there are folks who have questions about economics, about stand-up comedy, about climate change, about carbon taxes, I'm, I'm happy to answer them, or do my best anyway. And if there aren't, then I'll go back to telling jokes. But, but if, you, if you do have questions, then uh, uh, throw your hand up and I'll repeat the question or walk over to the mic and, uh, and all right, we have a, a brave volunteer. Doctor. <laughs> I've forgotten the lady's name, but she was a keynote speaker at the business of um, business of climate or business. What's the name of that? The re business of clean energy in Alaska, the Renewable Energy Alaska project. Mm -hmm. And she said the rate at which humans are consuming would require about 1.7 Earths. Now she said when she says this to an economics group, they argue about whether it's 1.6 Earths or 1.7. But the point is, we're already consuming more than the Earth can supply. So what's mm. the point of trying to go for five, six more cakes? Do you often make that point to people? Sir, this is a comedy show. <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, uh, so you could debate about how many Earths we're using up. It depends on the different resources. I mean, the, f the fundamental challenge I think that we face in this century is, at least in terms of things like climate change, we're already sort of over the limit and you know, we should be reducing carbon emissions. But at the same time that we should be reducing carbon emissions, there's four-fifths of the world's population that's in many ways not using enough carbon emissions because they don't have access to electricity, to, to transportation, to these things that we take for granted. So you have, um, uh, you have a tr tremendous population in, in the world, in India and Africa, still in some places in China and, and Asia, where people are very poor. And I don't think it's a question of, of you know, whether we should be going in that direction or not as much as it's a question of we are going in that direction. Right? Those, those, I think it's very likely that we're going to see uh, economic growth in India and Africa as they follow China's path in the decades ahead. And I think really the challenge for us is, especially in the rich world, is we need to try to develop technologies that are going to allow them to do that without the carbon emissions, without consuming the 1.7 or 1.9 or however many planets it is. And so that's why I, that's why I put a lot of effort into this, into carbon taxes, is that I feel like it's a way to, to prompt the private sector to really get serious about, okay, how do, we, how do we solve some of these problems? How do we generate renewable energy that's cheaper than coal? You know, because if we can generate renewable energy that's cheaper than coal or cheaper than fossil fuels, then China and India will adopt those technologies not because, not because they care about the planet, but because they're cheap. 
Right? And, and, and that's, I think, going to be a lot easier, whatever deals may or may not come out of the Paris talks, uh, the Paris climate talks later this year, that, that would be a lot easier than trying to come up with internationally negotiated agreements. Um, so that's, that's, um, that was my unfunny answer to that question. But that was, <laughs> that was a fine question, sir. Uh, thanks, Ron. That was really entertaining. Um, the idea of taxing the things that we don't want to see and encouraging the activities that we do want to see is logical and makes fundamental sense, but it reminds me of another case where we already do that. Um, the Federal Highway Trust Fund, which is funded by the gas tax, is uh, currently going bankrupt, and the gas tax has brought in less and less revenue as our fleet has become more and more efficient, generally a good thing. People are driving less, also a good thing. So the question is, what do we do when we're too successful? Uh, yeah, so, I th so the, the, the point is a good one. And um, the proposal that we have in Washington State actually has the carbon tax rate go up at about 5.5% a year in order to try to maintain revenue stability over time. Right? Because carbon emissions are hopefully going to fall we need to fill this hole that's created by reducing the state sales tax by a point, and that hole is going to get bigger as the economy grows, as population grows, as, 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 um, uh, you know, as, as time goes on. And so that's why we're raising the carbon tax rate over time. So what I can tell you is that over the short run, uh, and this is, I guess, you know, good news from the perspective of the permanent fund or whatever, uh, we're not going get to off, get off of fossil fuels you know, in the next five years. This is going to be a, a, a multi-decadal process to, to hopefully wean the economy off, off, of, off of fossil fuels. So in the short run, I feel pretty confident that we'll be able to maintain revenue stability. In the long run, in the 40 or 50 year time horizon, in the long run, we're gonna face revenue challenges. Okay. But I would argue, first of all, at least we will have solved the problem of climate change. <laughs> like that's, not, that's not bad. Uh, and secondly, as you point out with the Highway Trust Fund, we're gonna face those problems anyway. I mean, just because people stop using gasoline, if we start driving electric cars or drive less or whatever, we're still gonna need to maintain roads and bridges uh, around the country, and we're gonna have to have a way to do that. So, you know, the first gas tax in the nation was in Oregon. I think it came into effect in 1919. Uh, it seems likely to me that, uh, so 100 years ago, there were no gas taxes. Right? 100 years from now, there probably aren't gonna be any gas taxes. And so in the long term, in the you know, 50 year kind of time horizon, we're gonna have to do some sort of revenue for them anyway because we're gonna need to have ways of, 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 of funding the, the things that, that we have public services for. Um, but, but I would argue again that, that even, if we, even if we get zero revenue from a carbon tax, which is not gonna happen for quite a while, that's still evidence of a pretty successful policy in terms of addressing climate change. All right. Um, uh, thank you for those questions. I will tell you a, a, a few more jokes now, and I want to start by, um, uh, whoops, let me pull this back up again. I might have to start at the very beginning again. Uh oh, and we'll run through these real quick. Uh, let's see. I want to start by putting, uh, put, on my, put on my website and um, uh, how to get a hold of me. There we go. So there's my website, standupeconomist.com. If you're interested in the carbon tax stuff, it's carbonwa.org. Uh, if you've got a business card or, or um, uh, want to get on my email list, please give me your business card. Or if you go on my website, you can sign up for my email list. I won't spam you, but I'll let you know when I have shows coming up or new videos. Uh, every year, for example, I run the humor session at the annual meeting of the American Economic Association. <laughs> and you are all invited. <laughs> Uh, it's always in early January. This coming year, it's going to be in San Francisco. Uh, and if you or anybody you know is interested in economics, uh, it's really, I encourage folks to come for the whole conference. It's really amazing. Janet Yellen, the new head of the Fed, will probably be there this year or next year giving a talk. You get to see all the top economists from all over the world come and give speeches. And some of them are very high level, and, and many of them are accessible to, to everybody. Um, and the whole thing is just, it's like 10,000 economists from all over the world who converge on one city for a long weekend, and it's just wild. <laughs> so I'll close with a couple of uh, you might be an economist if jokes. Uh, so you might be an economist if you think that America's next top model should be an endogenous growth model. Um, you might be an economist if you don't read human interest stories because they don't interest you. 
Uh, you might be an economist if, you, if you've ever gone to a bank or other financial institution in the hopes of getting a date. If you plan to have your children born in December instead of January so that you can maximize the discounted present value of the child tax credit. <laughs> uh, you might be an economist if you, th if you think that supply and demand is a good answer to questions like, where do babies come from? <laughs> uh, you might be an economist if you adamantly refuse to sell your children because you think they'll be worth more later. And finally, you all have been such a fun audience, I want to try this out on you. This is a hard joke, but I, I, I want to try this out on you. Uh, you might be an economist if you read your fortune cookie out loud in a Chinese restaurant and put at the margin at the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Let me explain to you why that's a hard joke. Right, if you think about people in the world who know that when you go to Chinese restaurants, you're supposed to put, you're supposed to put in bed at the end of what's on your fortune cookie. You know, like hard work will be richly rewarded in bed. And then everybody laughs, and the next person reads their fortune cookie. Yeah, those people are over here on the Venn diagram. <laughs> this is a joke about Venn diagrams. And if you think about people in the world who know what at the margin means, those people are over here on the Venn diagram. Right? And those two parts of the Venn diagram, like they hardly overlap at all. Uh, one of the other times that I really struggled doing stand-up comedy about economics, my father is now retired. He lives in San Francisco. And every Tuesday, he goes hiking with a group of fellow retired German immigrants. And the last time I was in San Francisco visiting him, he sent an email out to his hiking group and he said, my son is coming on our next hike and we'll be providing free comedy at lunchtime. <laughs> so there I was in Mill Valley telling economics jokes to eight elderly German women. Uh, now that was a tough crowd. And I didn't do very well. But I figured as long as, as long as I wasn't doing very well, I might as well tell this joke about the fortune cookie that never works. Right, so I told the joke about the fortune cookie, and you wouldn't believe it, it didn't work. <laughs> but maybe because there was something in our shared German heritage or something, this one woman came up to me afterwards and insisted that I should explain the joke to her so that she could understand why it was funny. Right, and really, what followed was really this amazing cultural experience because I had to spend 10 minutes telling her about economics and at the margin. And then I had to spend 10 minutes telling her about Chinese restaurants and fortune cookies and in bed. Right? And after 20 minutes, I think she finally gets it. Right? Until I hear her say, as she turns to walk away with her hiking companion, she says something that I think is pretty much a tagline for the 21st century. She turns to walk away with her friend and she says, I still think that joke is about computers. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me to join you here in Juno. Have a great night, everybody. That was stand-up economist Jerome Bauman in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation, produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded April 1st, 2015 at 360 in Juno, with support from GCI, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Wastman and Associates Incorporated, Coor Alaska Incorporated, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Sea Alaska, and Alaska Power and Telephone. <laughs>